What's up, bees? Okay, so we're gonna talk about statics and torque today. There's two conditions, first condition, second condition for equilibrium. And we'll talk about what those two are and then discuss stability and applications and so on. Okay, so the first condition for equilibrium is that all the forces on something add up to zero. The net force on something is zero. If you have that, the sum of the forces equals zero. So if some dude standing here, we've got the weight pulling down from gravity and the normal force pushing up on him to keep him from flying away. If those forces are unbalanced, then you have an acceleration. Accelerations are bad if you're trying to stay put on the Earth. Okay, there's that's called uh, static equilibrium. Okay, the dude just sitting there. There's something called dynamic equilibrium, and that's where you know this car could be moving at constant velocity, but if it's at constant velocity, it has no net force. So it's moving, it's dynamic, but it's not changing its velocity. So it's called dynamic equilibrium. Uh, but Primarily, we're concerned with static equilibrium. Now, there's an important uh, example here. We've got a hockey puck. Okay, if you apply a force to a hockey puck, do, do equal and opposite, okay, then uh, the hockey puck will remain stationary. It is in equilibrium. That's the first case for uh, equilibrium. The second condition for equilibrium, though, is that the if you apply forces opposite each other, this is going to induce a rotation the hockey puck is going to spin because those forces are not lined up. So even though the free body diagram shows that the forces are balanced because they're both equal and opposite in the x direction, the difference between them is they are not lined up in the same point. Okay, so the second condition for equilibrium is that the torques have to be zero. The sum of the torques have to be zero. Well, what is a torque? A torque is the force you're applying times the distance uh, between the force and some axis of rotation. Some, some reference point. For a door, the hinge is a natural reference point, but you could measure the torque from any reference point as long as you're consistent. But in this case, you got a force here times that distance, that's your torque. You got a force here times that distance, that's your torque. If it induces a counterclockwise rotation, it's a positive torque. If it induces a clockwise rotation, it's a negative torque, so we got a minus on there. Okay, um, your uh, F here is... Um, you want the force perpendicular. I didn't catch that. Oops, sorry, my phone is thinking I'm talking to it. Um, if you apply a force to this distance, what you care about is that they are perpendicular to each other. And so this force here, you don't really care about the component of this force, which is towards the door. You care about the component that is perpendicular to the motion here. So there's your distance r, and you want the component of the force, oops, you want the component that way, so you're going to take f sine theta, or r sine theta, to times your f to get your uh, uh, torque. So torque is r f sine theta, it's the force you're applying, the distance that you're applying it from, some axis of rotation, times the angle, if the force is at an angle from the, from the radius, the lever arm, we call it, uh, r perpendicular is the moment arm, or the lever arm. Okay, and so um, if you apply a force here, and you've got a nail here for some reason, you nailed your hockey stick to the ceiling or something, and you apply a force here, this thing is going to rotate around that point. And so if you want to try and calculate um, the torque here, you want to take that force, and you want to multiply it not by this distance, but the perpendicular distance here. So how you do this is something called the line of action, and you draw a line through your force vector, and then you find, and then you draw a line so that you get a right angle between the axis of rotation and the the line that the force is on. And that, if you can figure out that distance, which they call r perpendicular, um, which is according to this r, the uh, uh, opposite opposite side over the hypotenuse, sine of theta. So r times the sine of theta, or f times the sine of theta, for that matter, will give you um, the torque. Okay, so the case for equilibrium, equilibrium is that all the torques add up. So if you've got a couple of kids here on a seesaw, he's got a weight here times this distance. Okay, that's one torque. A weight here times that distance, that's another torque. One's positive, one's negative, and they better equal zero if they're going to sit there um, politely. And so this example works through how to solve that problem. And then stability is, um, you know, you could have, there's a great example here of a pencil upside down. Technically, this is a stable configuration, but if you just barely uh, tap this pencil, it's going to fall over. So it's an unstable equilibrium. 
even though it's te technically in equilibrium. And then this pencil here, way more equilibrium, or way more stable equilibrium. Um, but what you care about here, when you have an object like this, the center of gravity is where your, um, uh, where you, the, it's the center of mass of an object. It's where you can treat the gravity as acting on the force of gravity for, for torque purposes. For example, if you had a sign here, um, the weight that pulls down on the sign, you can treat it as if it's right at the center. That's, that's a smaller torque than if you imagined the weight pulling down at the edge of a mass. It pulls down at the center of it, so everything falls at the same rate, all parts of it. An object that just falls under gravity is not going to rotate because it's going to feel uh, gravity right at the center, of course, ignoring air resistance or something. Okay, so then this chapter is just a little bit weird, so you get um, some examples of how to solve some of these problems um, and free body diagrams. Uh, then you've got your simple machines here. Uh, so, for example, if you want to pull a nail out of the ground, you use one of these uh, tools here to um, uh, uh, pry bar to pry the nail out. The longer your lever arm, the more your torque is, and the easier it is for you to pull the nail out. So the longer this thing gives you what's called a mechanical advantage. So in this case, there's your force times this distance gives you your total torque. Okay, um, and uh, blah, 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 blue. Then you've got your, this is a great one, your pulley system. If you pull on a, put some tension in the rope here, okay, that tension has to be um, pulled all the way through, and so you end up, you know, it's a little bit easier. With one tension force, you apply two tension forces to the uh, weight here, um, if you have a third pulley in there, now you got three tension forces, a fourth pulley, one, two, three, four, and so on. So by pulling just one with one tension force, you can get four times the tension force out, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you've got muscles and joints trying to, you know, imagine, uh, you know, if that's your axis of rotation, we ignore this force, but your bicep here is going to pull up. Look at that. Look how strong your bicep has to be to pull up here. And uh, with only a four centimeter lever arm to lift a book like this. So you've got this torque, you've got that torque, this force times that distance, this force times that distance, this bicep times that distance has to equal those two torques, um, which is kind of insane. Okay, so that's your, your example there. Um, the thing is about this one going back here, this elbow force down here, since it's at what we're considering to be the point of the pivot point, the distance between that force and the pivot point is zero, so we don't consider that torque uh, because it it's the force times the zero, which is kind of cool. Okay, and uh, there's some other things. Whoa, look at this guy. You can see his spine. Uh, it's not normal. Anyway, they're just showing that's stupid. Okay, so first condition for equilibrium, all the forces have to add up to zero. Second condition for equilibrium, all the torques have to add up to zero then you're in equilibrium. Now, if you're in equilibrium, it could be stable or not stable. It just depends how easy it is to perturb um, the state. Um, and then there's, we did the ex examples, and then you had your simple machines of a pry bar and a um, pulley system, and then uh, looked at it with the arms, with the muscles there, and how you do a problem there. Okay, see you guys later.